Good morning, everybody. Controversial statement to start with. Those of you who have heard me speak before know I like to throw a bit of controversy in to get you guys thinking. And so, uh, controversial statement to start with. Communication in every single project methodology, everyone is flawed. And it's not helping us deliver this project. There's no project methodology out there which does communication properly and does it run enough to help us communicate effectively in our projects. What I'm going to do today is hopefully improve that and give some tools and techniques and some better ways to communicate in your projects and take away that you can take to your projects tomorrow and start communicating better. Finally, we've got two quick takeaways right at the end. One on email communication, because we all do it and uh, none of us are good at it, we need to be or want to be. And social media, which is interesting how that's coming into project life and what we should do with it and what we shouldn't do with it. So, look at those right at the end. So, to start off with, I've got loads of great pictures here, so I can't see that I'm looking at me all the time. Every failure in every project is caused by communication. I mean, that's a bold statement, and perhaps it's a little too bold. Perhaps it's 99% of failures in projects rather than 100% of failures in projects. But it's not, not less than. And if you look at the studies, they kind of support that behavior as well. So in March this year, we carried out our, our own study. We interviewed. Uh, we surveyed 40,000 project managers with about 4,500 people replied, and we asked them what the number one skill was on projects they did successfully. 98% of people said the number one skill is communication. The 2% who didn't say communication didn't answer the question. So in fact, every single person who answered the question is that communication is the number one thing, the only really important thing, the first thing you should do when you test the project. It shouldn't really that surprising. You should also look at other surveys as well. So if you look at the Standish Group's Chaos Report into Project Value, one that's often brought out in these sorts of events, um, they list the, the top 10 reasons that projects fail. And in reality, even though they're missing things like incomplete requirements, lack of user involvement, it's communication. If we've got an incomplete requirement, somebody's not communicated properly. Either someone's not communicated the requirement to us properly, or we've not done the right of the list of interpreting their communication to get the right requirement. Lack of user involvement is communication. All of these things really boil down to communication. So communication might not cause every project failure, but it won't be part of it. Amazon has 312,234 books on communication. So, straw pump, who's read more? No, different straw pump. Put your hand up if you've read more than three books on communication in the last 12 months. So, that no hands up in the audience. Okay, so, our number one skill as project managers, the only thing that will make our project successful is effective communication. And none of us have even read three books on the next topic. It's quite interesting. Cost of core communication. Loads of surveys on what core communication does for us in terms of uh, cost of the organisation's money. So the, the best one looks at the 400 largest organisations in the UK and the US and try to total up the amount of lost productivity and lost hours from core communication. And they came to a staggering 37 billion dollars lost per year in the top 400 companies on communication. And that boils down to about $30,000 per employee per year. So pretty much double your wage bill with lost on communication, poor communication. That's quite surprising. So, a bit of theory. What is communication? This is taken straight from communication theory. And I'm actually going to expand on this model a little bit because I think Communication have five stages, and those of the theories only have three stages. We'll expand on a little bit later. Sticking to the theory for now, but the theory goes: stage one is codifying. Codifying is a process of turning your thought into a message that will be understood by recipients. So it's what goes on in here, what comes out of here, to make sure that it's intelligent and people are going to get the message that you're saying. Point two is delivery, and delivery is delivering the message. It's made up of content, the words you use, and it's also made of context, so the feeling, the emotion, what in communication theory is called power language. 
So it's when you look at someone in the wire to the eye, do you get a different feel than the words that say it? That's also important in communication, that's been done to delivery. And then the third point in the theory is decodifying. Decodifying is a process of the recipient taking your message, understanding it, and turning that into information and meaning. All three are important parts. We'll look at all three parts a little bit later in terms of what we ought to do to make sure we're communicating effectively. So let's go on to codifying first. Codifying is a process of turning your thought into a set of shared code that can be understood by a recipient. An important word on here is shared. Your recipient has to be able to understand the code that you use. And this code is made up of a whole range of things. It's made up from your cultural background, your shared language, your shared understanding about the rules of language, your shared experiences, any personal prejudices you might have. All of those affect the way you decode the message that's delivered to you. And if your experience is so far removed from the person who's giving the message, you probably won't get the right message. And there's, there's some great examples in, um, you know, in air traffic control, everybody has to speak English to each other. And there's some great examples done 20, 30 years ago about North Korean air traffic control. And they were losing lots of planes flying into mountains and things like that. They wanted to work out why. And what it boiled down to is the cultural differences between North Koreans. So what you've had is you've had a North Korean pilot flying a plane. And in North Korea, there's very much a command and control structure. And then if you're not the senior person, you can't question the guy who's at the top. You're not allowed to, which is culturally you're not allowed to do that. So the co-pilot would know they're going to fly into a mountain. And he'd say things like, are you sure we're on the right course here? And he knew they were going to fly into a mountain. Are you sure you're on the right course here? And of course the pilot would turn around and check any instruments in those courses and pilot. And that was it, 20 seconds later, into a mountain and landing. So it really does make a difference, the, the shared values, the experiences, the cultural background, and the people that you're communicating with. That decoding of your message does make a difference in getting your message across. Codified message then has to be delivered, and the important element in delivering a message is making sure that your recipient is on the same wavelength prepared to receive the message that you're going to tell them. So now they're expecting to hear what you're going to tell them. For example, if they're expecting to hear a message about X, and you tell them something about Y, they've not kind of preloaded their brain expecting what they're going to say, and they don't interpret your message correctly. That's why when you are standing up here and doing presentations, as I said, there's three rules of presentations. You tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. So tell them what you're going to tell them is getting you guys preloaded to hear the message I'm about to give. And that's important in communication that you guys are thinking, what message am I going to receive today and being prepared for that. <coughs> there's a, a change management process which can really help with ensuring your recipient is prepared to receive the message we want to deliver. And it's particularly useful in the context of delivering projects. It's called the AFPAL methodology. No prizes for getting one of the one so um, Let's look at the five stages. The five stages do, do tell us something about communication. So, the five processes that somebody needs to go through are stage one, awareness. And awareness is about being aware of the need for a change. Second stage is desire. Desire is wanting to be part of that change, wanting to change, wanting to support the change. Stage three is knowledge. Knowing what's required to change, what's their role in the change process? That's the knowledge stage. Ability is being able to change as we did up. I know what I need to do now, I've got the knowledge, have I got the ability, the tools, the systems to be able to do the change? And then reinforcement is feedback, constant feedback that changes progressive run. Think about what they're doing in projects. Projects are changing things, which is why communication becomes even more important. People don't want to change, people are very resistant to change. And this change process works really well in communicating with projects. And once you go on the change process, you rank each of these five processes on a scale of one to five for the person you're going to communicate with. So I'm going to communicate with somebody about a particular project we're working on. And uh, before I communicate with them, I say, right, let's take awareness. How aware are they of the need for change on this project? Do they understand why we're putting this change on this project? I'm going to scale the one to five. The point I get to a score three or lower, I stop. 
So if I say where the script, they're probably aware of what we're doing, probably aware of why we're doing it, I've scored them a five on that. Move on. Do they have the, the desire to change? Do they really want to change? Actually, no. They know why we should change, but it's not their problem. They're not that bothered. They don't have the desire. So what I do at that point is stop and make sure that what I communicate to these people is desire for if I start communicating knowledge or ability or reinforcement messages, they're not prepared to hear them. Because they've not gone that far down the journey yet in their own minds to think, I don't need knowledge because I'm not doing this, because I haven't got desire to do this. So you can give a knowledge message left, right, and centre, and you just will not take the message. And this is about making sure that people you're communicating with are prepared to decode the message you're going to give them. And we'll come back to look at Ad Car a little bit later because there are some more things we can do with that on projects. The other part of delivery is the, the power language, the, the non-verbal part of communication. And the theory goes that how you say something is more important than what you say. So let's take the following example two statements. So statement one, this project in a mess. We're going to deliver the project over time again. We've got to do something to stop this. That's statement one. Statement two, this Project's in a mess. We're going to go over budget and over time again. We've got to do something to stop this. So show of hands, which one of those statements is most likely to move you to do something if you're receiving that message? And if you're moved by statement one, you're going to do anything. Okay, so no hands, hands up if you're moved by statement two, we're going to do something. Okay, do show of hands. Both statements use exactly the same words. Okay, so it really, really, really is important how you say something, not just the words you say. And we'll come on to look at that in the project context in a few minutes as well. Okay, so. There's also a significant opportunity for misunderstanding in communication someone not to get what you're talking about, or either you're coding to be wrong, you're delivering to be wrong, or you're decoding to be wrong. I'm going to play you a little video, it's a little bit of fun that explains or shows the uh, misunderstanding of communication and the effects of design. Understanding, 
where you attempt to discover completely what they meant by their statements. So there are five known methods of feedback, and good communication has been. Communication is about the theory said coding, delivery, and decoding. Feedback to your own opportunity to check your message was correctly delivered. Remembering style is important, because if you've got the wrong style, your message may not be correctly delivered. And it's also to make sure it's correctly decoded, and your chance to do something about it if it wasn't. So, summarise the, the, the theory part. We've come to the end of the theory part now, I promise you. So, summarise all the theory together. I've put it into a five step status or process for, for managing communication. My five steps are thought initially, which is planning what you're going to say. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll come on to planning in a little, little bit as well. We haven't looked at planning yet. Planning is important. Then codifying, making sure recipients are ready to receive the message you're about to give, and that's the ad part change model we looked at. Then delivery, remembering how we're delivering is more important than the words we use. Decoding, the recipient has made sense of what you've said. And then audio, which is a feedback loop to make sure your message has been properly received. So, Let's put it all back into a project context, now we've looked at some of the theory. Let's take a look at the communication theory around projects. Anybody recognise this? This is the table of contents from the print to communication plan template. Okay. So while most of us probably aren't using Prince 2, we're probably a very large percentage of us using derivatives of. And whether you use Prince 2 or some other project methodology, they all have something similar to this in a communication plan template. The thing is, I don't think that's a communication plan. It's a plan for who to disseminate project reports to and on what frequency. There's absolutely nothing in there about communication with too late. There's no concept in there the feedback loop. There's nothing to check communication is correctly received. There's just nothing we've looked at in communication theory so far in there. That's who am I going to send my project reports to in there? And how am I going to record I've done it and how am I going to record them this evening? But that's the Prince 2 communication plan. It gets worse if you, um, if you look at the uh, Prince 2 process model. So this is a Prince 2 process model, um, which we hope you're all familiar to to an extent. Communication is mentioned on the process model twice. If and here. Very down in your text, twice. Our number one skill on projects mentioned twice, very down in your text, on our process model. It's even worse if you look at the life cycle of the communication plan in Prince 2. So, so this diagram has got all of your stages and life cycle, all of the documents you produce across the top, and all of your stages in your project down, down the side, and it looks at when you should create and update and modify the document set in your project. I know you can't see it particularly well, but the, the red line under is the communication plan, and how that should be modified during the project. So the Prince 2 guidance is that your communication plan is created and they're never ever updated, even if your project runs for three years. That's the Prince 2 guidance. It should be an input into the processes, it's created once, it's never ever updated. Most of these other documents have update steps in your communication plan forms of Prince 2 technology has zero update statements in it. That's surprising. And that's what I think is wrong about the communication learning where we're getting from these project methodologies. Communication is way more important. Communication should be all around that diagram. It should be updated and changed at every single stage, not never. Final bit of theory, something called a Jahari window. So named because the two guys who invented it. I think one was called Joe and one was called Harrington. So I love the fact his academics are always very humble and modest about it. But it's a tool that we use for, for helping plan communication. It's widely used in communication theory. And I think we can add real value into our projects if we use this for the tool in our planning communication in our projects. So the purpose of the window is that the communication you're about to have, you fill in the four panes in the diagram. In the top left square, you fill in the information that only you know and the receiver of your communication does not know. 
And these are opportunities for your message to be decoded incorrectly because you have some assumptions of the knowledge that the other person doesn't. You don't have that same shared context for them to be able to decode your messages properly. The bottom left square, you put in the information that no one knows. And I never get this part of the, uh, the thing, because how do you know what you don't know? I'm going to leave that there to one side of the ideas. The bottom right square, you put in the information that only the recipient knows. So what do they know that I don't? Because again, that's an opportunity for your message to be decoded incorrectly. It's important to get that out there. Top right square, you put in the information that's known to everybody. And the purpose of a Jahari square is that when you're communicating, to get every point on that diagram into the top right quadrant. So if you've got all your points in the top right quadrant, you're communicating from shared knowledge and equal footing, and hopefully a good basis for your message to be correctly understood and correctly decoded. It's the best way of making sure your communication is effective, is that everything you're talking about is in that top right quadrant. We'll come back on to looking at that very shortly. So I'm going to propose a new model for communication planning on projects. Because I didn't like the table of contents, it doesn't it really doesn't fit well with me. It doesn't fit well with what I see happening on projects. I see communication going all the time, so why does it feel we talk about it and give us some tools to help us do it better? And this is a template I'm going to use for my communication planning. And we'll go through an example in a minute to how, see how we fill it in. I fill in one copy of this template that every stakeholder group or stakeholder I have in my project. And I update this template after each and every effective communication with that stakeholder group. Because communication is fluid, things change, I want to uh, keep, a, keep a good track of that. So the best way to explain the template is to look at an example. The example we're going to look at is putting a piece of recruiting software into an organisation. This organisation had never used software to control their recruiting process before. It always is a manual, paper-based process, and there's a piece of software going in to help them manage their recruiting process better. So, stakeholder group, which is right at the top of the recruiters. So these are the people who are going to be using the new software system day in, day out. So that's the stakeholder group that this communication plan is for. The first thing we do is we put in their ASCAR scores, which is the, the green and red circles at the top of the page. This will help frame the sort of things we should be communicating with this group, what sort of things they're prepared to hear. Remember, if we deliver a message they're not prepared to hear, it will not be properly received. So it's important before we communicate to this group, we understand where they are in the communication lifestyle. So these guys are really aware of the need for change. They're in the guts of doing the recruiting every day. They, they know they're all working overtime, they're working double shifts, they know the recruiting function is really stretched, but so they're aware this is the need for changes right across. They score across on, on the ADCAR model for that. Their desire for change is also very high. Working double shifts is a great incentive to uh, someone to change what they're doing. So these guys really want to change as well. So they score four on the desire. But their knowledge about how to change is a two. And if we score less than three, we stop. Nobody in this team has ever used a recruiting piece of software before, they've never used a recruiting system before. So they don't really know how to do it. Yes, I really want to change, yes, I really feel the pain that I feel the need to change, I don't know clue how to do it. So they're, they're stuck at the knowledge point. So already this tells us that communication that we have with this stakeholder group next should be focused on knowledge. If we start to focus on ability and get them to do the change, they're going to resist. And they're not going to hear our messages properly because they want the knowledge. <laughs> the next thing I list are the things that are known to me as the, the project manager in the top left. And I've listed three things there. I've listed contenders, which is what systems are we looking at? What are the available systems out on the marketplace? And I put a K after the word contenders because this is giving knowledge to this stakeholder group. We also, I know what the budgets are for, for this project. The recruiters have got no idea what the budgets are. But the budget is going to affect their ability to do something, not their knowledge about what to do. So I've got an aid for ability, I'm not going to talk to them about budgets, because they're not ready to hear about budgets. But now I know they're not ready to hear about budgets, I can make sure I don't fall into that communication problem. And the third one I've listed there is timescales. I know that when this thing is implementing by, and if it needs implemented tomorrow or in three years' time, that's knowledge that's important for the recruiters to understand so they can be on board with this change. 
things that are known to everyone are the pain of the process, and that's in my, my top right quadrant. And I split the top right quadrant into three. The third one doesn't suggest you two, but that I think there's significant more advantage in splitting into three. So, so my outer ring, which is this one here, trying not to fall off the stage, but my outer ring, I put elements in there when I've communicated a message to everybody the first time. Second level, I put my points in there and I've communicated the message to them the second time. And the inner circle I put pain, I only put points there where I've had feedback from the group, so I know they've got the message. So I'm not just assuming just because I've communicated it's been received, because we know that that doesn't always work. So I've played a little bit of caution there. And then we just put that I've feedback on during that real outer circle there. Then I fill in the what I need to. Sorry, I've known to others. Too far then I fill in known to others. So there are some, there's some other contender systems which the recruiting team have been looking at in their lunch hours because they, they feel the pain, they've got the desire to change. So they've been doing some internet research themselves and looking at other systems in their lunch hours and well, while they're sat at home watching these things. And but I've got no idea what systems they've been looking at. And I need to know that because if I'm communicating to them, we're going to put a system in here's a list of contenders. And they've seen a different contender that does something different. They're going to keep up my messages quite different. So I need to know what they've been looking at as well. Okay, then I come in at the bottom left what I need to know from them list. So what's the purpose of my next communication pattern? What information am I trying to get from this stakeholder group? And I'm trying to get three things. I'm trying to understand what the um, most manual processes are in the recruiting function. I'm trying to understand what volumes they have going through the recruiting function now and what volumes they plan a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. And I'm trying to understand what the larger bottlenecks are in the recruiting system. I'm trying to get that answer the next communication. And I also put in there what they need to know from me in the next communication. And I have some information to impart on them, which are what management requires in the system to report. Management wants to report in some other ways that in the system. Remember I said I need to see feedback to put something on the inner section on, on the top right pane. I, I take the effort to list what feedback I've received so that I know I'm not just putting something in there because I wish it was it were in that quadrant. I actually want to document the fact that it genuinely is in that quadrant. So in this case, people reviewing the systems in their own free time, people in the recruiting team cancelling meetings because they're too busy to attend, people in the recruiting team saying, no, I can't recruit another guy for you, they're too busy. That gives me feedback that they're feeling the pain. That gives me feedback that, yeah, they're in that pain, they'll get it. I'll put that on the computer as well. And then finally, I analyze all of this to decide what the next communications actions are with this team. In this case, I'd like to run a workshop to list all the content of systems out there. I'd like to put requirements around bottlenecks and the volumes they're going to have. And I want to um, agree the time scales that we're going to implement new systems. So I'm not discussing budget with them yet because that's the ability set and they're not at the ability stage. I'm really interested in, in doing the budget yet. So a tool like this really helps me have effective communication that I know the audience are receptive to and I'm checking and being decoded correctly from the feedback loops. To knock something up like that takes five minutes because you're, you're dealing with these people on a daily basis. Like a whole bunch of these templates printed off, not something like that takes five minutes. It really isn't a big job. But it's really effective for planning communications on projects and making sure your communications are effective. Another example of exactly the same project, but this time my stakeholder group is the finance team. And the finance team are important because they've got the money that we're going to need to buy this new piece of software. And it's bound to be a cloud with the software that can clear any costs so the finance team will to authorise that expenditure. But the finance team are in a totally different place. The finance team have got no idea why we need to do this. Because they don't feel the pain of the recruiting process. They don't see the drag of the manual process that all the other guys are seeing today. So in the finance team, I'm going to communicate to them what's actually happening. I'm going to communicate to them about the lost revenue we're making as a business because we're not able to recruit the right people. I'm going to talk to them about the cost of the recruiting process and how ineffective and inefficient that is from a cost point of view. Because then the finance team get an awareness. I can't start talking to them about, actually I need some money from you, until they get that. 
And this is, and I've put the finance in there deliberately because quite a lot of us have finance involved in our projects, but quite often we kind of leave them to one side and communicate with them differently or later and don't get them engaged really early. And then we communicate with them later and we have trouble. So we put them in finance and we pay them, never give us the money we need, never involve them where they need to be. Do they have quite a lot of help them through the journey? And summing it all up, the, the new model I've presented follows the five-step process of communication we looked at when we went through the communication theory. So, thought, it makes you think about what you're going to do. The physical exercise of sitting down with that template and writing things on it makes you think about what you're going to communicate. The codify, making sure the person who's receiving the message is prepared to receive it is the add part piece across the top. Are we prepared to receive the message that I'm going to deliver? Yeah. Delivery, you have to deliver it. It's a little hard to, to put a whole bunch of uh, templates around getting you guys passionate and excited about the things you should be delivering passionately and excitedly. Um, but one of the things I, I advocate and, and I do when I sit down with people, I have this template in front of me when I'm communicating with them and I share the template with them. And that kind of helps with the delivery to an extent. They get what you're trying to do because they can see your planning see the message you're trying to get across. So that helps with the delivery. The decodify, that's why we have the feedback loops in there to check if they receive my message correctly. That's why I'm known to all, I have the one, two, three stages rather than just putting in one to make sure it's being decodified correctly. And then the audience is part of the feedback loop and part of sharing that template with the audience that I'm presenting to. So if I'm sat down with the recruiters, I give them a copy of the template, I need you a copy, let's just check I've got that right, yep, got that right, or oh, you're in the right place, now let's move on and talk about the next presentation. Two final quick things to, uh, to finish with. Email. We all get a lot of it, most of us are really bad at managing it. Uh, and I've seen a really effective strategy I'm just going to share with you guys, and hope that it helps a couple of you out to, to manage your emails a little bit better. It's, um, a little bit of a strategy that some people won't want to do because they're a bit scared by it. But trust me, this really works. It really works. So, stage one. Delete everything that's in your inbox. Right now, today, go back to your office and delete everything that's in your inbox. I told you it's a scary strategy. Trust me, it works. It's not close out your email account. It's not like that. It really does help you manage email. But to start, get a clean sheet of paper. Delete everything in your inbox. And if your sole person says, oh, I can't delete everything in my inbox, and there's hundreds of others out there, find it somewhere that's not in your inbox. And don't call it copy of inbox, and just put it all in there. Properly find it. Do either projects or people or dates, properly find it somewhere. So then your inbox becomes your inbox rather than your filing cabinet, because that's what people use in their inboxes for. They're using their inboxes for filing. So then what we do, for everything new that comes into our inbox, we have a four step process. Step one, spend a maximum of two minutes on every email in your inbox. You can only spend two minutes on each email in your inbox. I know some of you decided they couldn't even know a lot of my emails took more than two minutes. I'll show you what to do with those in there. Okay? Rule one, two minutes on everything in your inbox. Rule two, if when you're reading the email, you can complete whatever action you need to complete inside those two minutes, do it. Do not leave it in your inbox and say, I'll come back to that later because I don't really feel like doing that right now. Don't do that. It takes less than two minutes. Do it. Don't really send it to yourself. Don't mark it on your own. Don't do all that sort of stuff we all do. Just get it done. Do it. Get it out of your inbox. Step three. If possible, when you've done that process, delete the email. There are so many emails we keep that we really, really don't need to keep. Most emails we receive for information purposes. Most people's deleted items are not really deleted, they're in kind of a recycle folder that you can still search on, it's in whatever you want on, but it just unclutters everything. So, delete it. If you don't like deleting it, file it, you've got a nervous disposition, but I, I do. Step four, final one. If you can't do it in two minutes, these are the emails that you can't handle with inside our two minutes, you have to delegate it. And you have to delegate it either to somebody or to your team. And delegating it to your to-do list means exactly that. You delete it from your email inbox and you write an action on your to-do list. So at the end of every day, you should have zero emails in your inbox at the end of every day. And it's a really nice feeling when you do. The reason this strategy works is that most people keep all their emails in their inbox. 
and their inbox becomes their to-do list. But their inbox becomes a really unstructured, really cluttered, way too big to-do list. They can't really get a feel for what they're supposed to be doing and can't really find the things they're supposed to be focusing on. And that's, that's really ineffective because what actually happens in, in, in the body, your brain, our brains are clever in the thing we are. No one else that we're supposed to use 3% of our brain. So there's a 4%, which is the email part of your brain. There, there, there is an email part of your brain. If you're leaving to do in your email inbox and not deleting your inbox, your brain remembers. Because your brain knows that is not an effective to do this. But it keeps it in your memory. And then what happens is you're in the shower, you're walking the dog, you're playing with the kids with the week, and you go, oh, I've just forgotten to do. Remember, it was in my email inbox, Jim sent it to the masters, and it pops into your head at the most really awkward moment. Thinking, Where the hell's that come from? And that's because your brain is remembering it, because it knows you do not have an effect to do this. So it keeps it all in your brain, and that's onto the stress and the stress and the stress, and all my email, I've got to get to my email. And it really builds up. If you delete your email inbox and write it on your to do list, I don't know how it works, I don't know why it works, all of that goes away. The brain kind of says, Okay, I know it's being put on a really effective in this, I can forget about it now. It just forgets about it. And it's just amazing the transformation it makes. I don't know how many emails you guys get, but I get four or five hundred emails a day. I get a huge amount of emails a day. I have absolutely zero email stress. Because my email is what to get to every single day. It takes me 20 minutes to blast through four or five hundred emails and manage into that process and I'm done the next day. And it is a really, really effective way. So, Try it, I know you're a bit brave out there, give it a go. It really does work. If you find it does work and you think, wow, this is the best thing since last bread, don't be a man all about it. <laughs> Finally, social media, last one, the very last slide. Social media, what's its place in communication? What's its place in communication specifically in the field of project management? My advice, don't use social media for communication in project management. Ever. And I'll tell you why. But the code for social media is really unique and it's not universal. And that means messages get decoded wrongly, there's no effective feedback loop in social media, and the power language, the, the body language, and how it's been delivered is entirely messy. So here's a warning tale and a true story about social media. Chris, Friday afternoon last October. Sharon Celine exchanged text messages with her daughter who was in college. Chatted back and forth over text, mum saying how things going, and daughter answering back with yeah, things are great, lots of smileys, lots of hugs, all them things, emoticons we put into our, into our text messages. Later that night, her daughter attempted suicide. In the days that followed, it came to light she'd been holding up in the dorm room, crying, and showing signs of depression. A completely different reality than the one she conveyed in her texts, in her Facebook posts, and in her tweets. As human beings, our only real method of connection is through authentic communication. Indeed, it's only when we can hear a tone of voice or look into someone's eyes that we're able to know I'm fine doesn't mean I'm fine, or I'm on board with that idea doesn't mean that I'm on board with that idea. And this is how social media gets really dicey. Anyone can hide behind the text, the email, the Facebook post, and project any image they want to create an illusion of their choosing. They can be whoever they want to be. And without the ability to receive those non-verbal clues, which is how we code, their audience is our non wiser. And this presents an unprecedented paradox because with all the powerful social media technology at our fingertips, we are more connected and potentially more disconnected than ever before. So for all these reasons, Social media creates ineffective communication. My advice, don't use it in projects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for time.